This is the um, second day of the Aplerna Woodblock Conference, and this is the second or third of the workshop. Third, right? There's so many, I can't keep track. Exactly. <laughs> it's so been about three. This is a somewhat ad hoc one that, that we've organized. Um, Rob Skiff and I have been having a lot of discussions back and forth about the nature of a Plerno in relation to agency, capitalism, you know, values, all, all the sort of big picture, sticky kinds of things that people get, get uh, very concerned about. So this is a chance for um, viewers to, to write in and ask questions. We already have a set of them. But we wanted to also lay out um, you know, some of the, the things that keep coming up over and over again. And how I think with the Plerno, it's easy to get um, mixed up about this because they're doing something quite different than most other educational institutions have been doing. So Rob is going to be doing most of the talking during this. I'm going to interject every once in a while. I've got a set of questions. Um, why don't we begin by you talking a little bit about the model of a Plerno and what were the four big problems that uh, a Plerno is supposed to, to address? So uh, when I was a uh, doctoral student, and I still am and I'm finishing my dissertation, uh, the things that I wrote about were uh, student loan um, financing and the student loan bubble um, in the United States. Uh, most of the education is, uh, most of higher ed is financed through uh, subsidized loans or unsubsidized loans and government programs where students take out um, uh, debt to pay for their undergraduate or graduate yeah, education. Uh, um, it's ginormous. Yeah. And depending on where you go to school, it's, you know, really huge. And so the debt piece, um, you know, now I think it's 1.2 trillion. It's actually there's more student loan debt than there is credit card debt. Yeah, it's a huge um, risk to the financial markets, and a huge risk actually to people because if you're a student and you have lots of debt, then you can't um, start your own business. You are going to have a harder time becoming involved in uh, social entrepreneurship. You're going to have a hard time getting involved or finding something that can pay in terms of. Um, you know, if you want to get into uh, uh, service or the helping industries. Yeah, it really handicaps you in a lot of ways. Yep. Um, and prevents you from starting to accumulate some uh, wealth and resources in your old, in your, for your old age. Yeah. Um, and so that is combined, so the student loan debt had me concerned, but another piece was um, part of the work that I did to pay for my, um, uh, doctoral program. I mean, I was lucky that I got um, some uh, money from uh, the University of Vermont, and they were very helpful in terms of supporting me. Um, but I also worked as an adjunct, and Huge issue. Uh, as an adjunct, what I would do is I get assigned roughly, you know, two or three weeks, or sometimes two days before the semester started, and I would be given this class that was generally, you know. It, it, this was online, sometimes in person, and the class would kind of not be very well built. And so I'd spend all this time changing the class or adding different things to it. And um, at the end of the semester, I've put in all this work creating this really great class, and of course I didn't own it. And I, you know, sometimes I wouldn't get the same class the next semester. Yeah. And, you know, that was just kind of like unfair. Here I, you know, for my, I do a lot of work. I also rescue the institution. Okay, in some ways, I provide the students with a great experience, and um, I don't own the class that I am teaching. Yeah. And the next thing that really struck me is, you know, I was getting paid, you know, three grand, three grand for the class, and then I did a calculus on how many people I was teaching, what I was getting paid, and I said, wow, somebody's making a lot of money. It ain't me. Yeah. Um. And so that kind of um, then, as I'm going through my doctoral program, I'm looking around for a um, sort of a tenure track job, and I do a little business analysis of you know what's the stability of me, what's the chances of me getting a tenure track job, and next, if the institution, what's the odds that the institution that I'm going to join is actually going to survive in the same form over the next ten years? Yeah. Okay. And what I found out was 
Um, one, the the business model is is really kind of broken for um, most traditionals in higher ed. And what I mean by business model, I'm not talking about I'm talking about two things. I'm talking about social capital, financial capital, and cultural capital. Okay, generating all three of those pieces. Um, I'm not talking about making you know just you know making money. Okay, but if you want to do a Marxist interpretation, okay, who owns the means of production? Okay, and um, who is benefiting from the means of production? And what I and and what yeah, I it's kind not, of it's not the students, that's for sure. Well, I, I kind of said the people who are benefiting are kind of the bondholders, okay, the yeah. people who are holding the majority of the student debt. And then I started to look at um actually um uh, the number of students taught and the amount of pay that people were receiving, and I realized after looking at a couple different schools that the number of students that it, that a professor encountered mm -hmm. was inversely proportional to the amount of money they were making. So the more students you taught, the less money you made. That makes and, sense. Yeah. And, um, and I also looked around at, at my department and looked around at, at the university where I was at, and I realized that the people who were getting paid the least were generally um, were women who were in tenure-track positions. Um, not sorry, they weren't in tenure track positions. They were adjuncts, adjunct positions, yeah. and they, even though they were, if you did a strict economic analysis, they were giving, they were returning tremendous amounts of capital to their institution. They constantly felt as if they might get canned. Yeah. They might not be let, let might not be given the next job. So, um, you know, and and being blunt. Um, uh, I needed to find a job and was rapidly realizing that that I was unemployable in the um, in traditional higher ed um, for a variety of different reasons, which has probably become quite apparent as we uh, have done you know done uh, woodblock. Um, and so those are two big issues. Debt, yep. Adjuncts. There are two others that you wanted to right as well. The other piece is um, the uh, the lack of um, you know, account of well, the one is the technology piece. Okay, yeah. um, disintermediation is the. Well, well, let's start with disintermediation first. Okay. Tell them what that fancy term means. Okay, disintermediation means sort of like cutting out the middleman yeah. or middle person. Um, instead of uh, trying to get people when they're exchanging something to cut out the person who's acting as the intermediary. Okay, the, the person between the gatekeeper, and that. Um, and so disintermediation is, you know, eliminating barriers to people exchanging things. Now, the disintermediation, uh, hold up. I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the, uh, we'll get to the Twitter comments in a second. Let me finish. We'll do those a little bit later. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things with the disintermediation, one of the things is technology is, is creating a lot of it's creating a lot of changes. We all know that's you know everybody yes. knows that. But what it's what it's really doing is it's stressing out traditional institutions. There's so much information and change that is happening at um, two institutions today yeah. that the traditional command and control structure doesn't really work. Okay. Yeah, it's not agile um, really. at all. Yeah. It worked a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. But it doesn't work anymore, especially, you know, let's talk about degree program formation, okay? If you want to, it takes years for a new degree to be introduced to a university yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um, and by the time the degree is introduced... Maybe the market demand is gone. Yeah, or, the discipline's yeah. completely changed. Yeah. So, the, so technology um, also allows the, the elimination of dependencies of time and place for where education occurs. So it changes access. So Yeah, so that's the fourth thing you're, yeah. you're going to get to is access. Um, the, we can learn the technology now with video teleconferencing, with the database, with the data storage and the, and the fact that it's really cheap. Um, you can store video text audio anywhere. You can upload it. The fact that it is so cheap to do that and the fact that the the, the video teleconferencing is so good that you can have that small we can do that. student. We can do this. 
um, we can have um, small groups of you know a group a faculty working with students from all over the world and it can be what I think is the best in education which is kind of the Socratic you can work on projects together you yeah. can have conversations you can build knowledge you can you can actually if you have a you're working with a particular community the community can decide on what issues it wants to solve and seek out the experts and the knowledge to solve those particular pieces and it's all accessible on you know on a smartphone yeah and in traditional higher ed is still very much dependent upon people coming to the location yeah. okay and and coming to a particular point in time in a day and all sitting in the classroom and spending two hours either hearing a lecture or or engaging in a discussion even with online stuff you know for instance I, I teach online for an institution a traditional institution that uh, has enough foresight to realize that you should do some online classes. I have people, you know, wanting to say, like, "How can I get in your class? You know, you're teaching an ethics class. I'd really like to say that." I'm like, "Well, you'd have to sign up with this university. You'd have to sign up with this college. You would have to matriculate. You would have to do all these things that you know would be required in order for them to to get into my my class. And then, in part because I'm an adjunct, I may not be teaching that." Right, you know, it may have gotten farmed out to one of the full timers who preferred, you know, he wanted to teach that class this summer, or, you know, maybe they decided they didn't want to teach, they, they weren't going to do that class. So there's no guarantee that you'll actually get it. Um, so the, how is it? How is a, a how is um? I almost said Adorno. How is a player know? <laughs> that's that's very funny. Yeah, it is. <laughs> how how is a player know addressing these things? Why why did that lead you to to want to do player know? Well, the um. The biggest issue is access. Okay. okay. So we've hit a capacity issue in, in globally in terms of higher ed when it's dependent so much on the traditional models of delivery, which are yeah. centered around physical classroom spaces. We have, we have locations. We have a, a surplus of people who actually could teach, who can't get jobs in these 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 slots, except at you know subsidence wages. Uh, we have a ton of students, some of whom can't can't get in. We're letting them in by giving them huge debts. Well, yeah. the, I mean, there are, you know, we've hit a, if we measure um, social progress by, you know, financial, just what people are making, it's a disaster. Yeah. If true. we measure, if we measure the waste of talent out there, because number one, a person can't get access to um, uh, good education and good instruction, or we measure the waste of people who can't who are great and who can't teach. Access is huge, is a huge issue. Traditional higher ed being so dependent on the brick and mortar and, and so still so dependent upon, you know, apply to a particular school. There's a certain number of slots. Yeah. I mean, there are seven billion people on the planet um, and a lot, a lot of people education. And we're not going to reproduce this. Okay, we can can't afford to yeah. to meet those needs. Of really, when you think about it, still the people who have access to higher education, the best kind of teaching, the numbers are teeny, and we really need to make it so that part of sort of the the that we not only think of financially, but we think of this culturally and socially. The better educated a population is, and especially the 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 in terms of the an individual deciding what they want to learn and a person in a particular culture yeah. or area wanting to learn, the better off we all are because they can maximize their potential. Yeah. Now, isn't that? I mean, that's kind of supposed to be what so this you know, is the a, game is about. So this is a good segue into tackling one of the big questions that that has come up. Um, you know, you've got something called a marketplace for for classes and. Um, some people are worried that this is this is a capitalist model, therefore it's market forces that are going to be deciding what's going on. How are you any different, say, than some of the other, uh, you know, for the, the big for profits out there that are getting you know scrutinized for taking you know uh, student loans yep. and, and not returning um, on the investment. So, you know, what do you have to say about that? Um, capitalist running dog. Capitalist running dog that I am. I'm in the tie, living in New England. Um, so one of the things that has happened in the last 10 years and, and the breakdown in command and control management techniques and, and those hierarchies and the fact that they don't work, they're not adaptable, 
is that um, they haven't been replaced by anything that is grassroots and self-organizing. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, one of the ways in which you self-organize is you allow people to exchange between you allow people to exchange services, exchange yeah. knowledge, exchange whatever. Um, uh, in a very transparent and open system, where yeah. there are where there's um, as much discovery and transparency as possible. Okay. Now, what that does is that it kind of weeds out. It allows the it it, it, it uh, weeds out is probably not the right term. It, it's much more efficient. Then for and and as much then you're actually making a create, fiat decision. You're going to do it this. You're way. going to do it this way, or or here's my group of of, of so-called experts from the top Ivy League schools or wherever, yeah. and and they're going to decide on this is what we need over the next ten years. I mean, we've become a society because of the information and the the explosion of information and the explosion of change. We've really become a command and control society in, in a lot of aspects. In other words, we have a small group of people who are yeah. decide, making the decisions for large numbers of individuals. So am I a capitalist running dog? I'm, well, you know, I'm the opposite, meaning that yeah. I'm trying to use resistance for me in that heart and negri, you know, uh, the, the sense of resisting some of the hegemonic moves is about empowering the individual and about creating agency. And if you're going to create agency, you have to have choice. And you have to allow people to choose for themselves the routes they're going to take. And you also have to make it completely transparent about what is your cut. Yeah. Okay. So I can't eliminate. I'm trying to eliminate as many of the do as much disintermediation in, in education as possible. Okay. Yeah. And I'm trying to place the the capital, the 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 reward for the work and for the great teaching back in the hands of the faculty. But I'm also trying to help the students. Yeah. Okay. Find maximize their choices to find the mentors and the classes and the skills that are best going to meet their needs. So, you know, we have um, our business structure. You know, we're an LLC, a privately held company. Now, why are we a privately held company versus a not for profit? Um, I have a really strong vision of where I want to take this in terms of the um, uh, the equality. And the um, the disintermediation and the, and the value that I feel of faculty and students and cutting out a lot of the 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 middle the middlemen. If I were a not for profit, if a planner was a not for profit, we would have a board and I would be answerable to the board. It would take now, a lot of time to get anything done. Yeah, well, I think you'd also um, a lot of not for profits will lose their vision. Yep. And and they also become, if they're successful, they also become sort of subverted by their own success. Yeah. So right now, um, we're an LLC. We may transition to another type of governance system, but I need to be able to, and our team needs to be able to feel secure that our vision, that we're not going to compromise on our vision. Yeah. And um, we're also, you know, we haven't accepted venture capitalist money. Okay. Because and we're doing this um, through some self-funding and a lot of uh, you know Indiegogo. exchange for labor. The the Indiegogo piece, the fact that you know Daniel and Dan own a part of a Plano, um, and along with you know the board of uh, directors and some a few other people. Um, but we're not gonna. I control the vast majority, and I'm not gonna sell. We're not interested in building up a Plano and flipping it to Google and making a billion dollars. Oh yeah. Or Yahoo, or Apple, or, Apple, or GE, yeah, yeah. or you know, we're I'm not, we're not interested in that. We've got to be interested. Um, I'm interested in making sure that education is affordable, and I'd much rather spend my time on making sure that adjuncts get a decent pay, and and we're able to do something really cool with education. Because, to be honest, I mean, like, what else is there to spend? This is, I mean, this sounds naive, but what else is there to spend your time on? Um, you know, I, I live in Vermont. It's a great, great place. I have three squares. Um, you're staying at my house. Yeah. You know, it's not extravagant. It's a nice house. What, I mean, like, I, mean, I don't need the Gulfstream 5 or the um, or the Ferrari, and, and that's not what this is about. I think, I think something, when, when people bring up capitalism, one thing that they, they lose sight of is that capitalism, 
first of all, whether it's understood as being good or bad, that's a, a separate question. But you can't call all exchange automatically capitalism. Just simply because there's exchange, simply because there's some sort of you know, structure where money is changing hands for services, um, that happens in, in, you know, in all different types of economies. And then you know, the other thing to keep in mind is when we're worried about some of the, the bad parts about capitalism, it's usually because of outside forces that don't respect the values coming in and you know, leveraging somehow what's going on over here where there is some sort of value and making it do something different. So, you know, for example, if you if you develop a really good company that's doing something good and then Google buys you, I don't buy that, you know, that, that, that Google, you know, they're, they're uh, don't be evil. I think they, they do sometimes, you know, err. But um, even though, you know, it's their technology <laughs> we're using for this. Um, it's, it's when something is coming in from the outside and removing agency. And so we'll talk more about agency well, in a moment. You know? I mean, uh, Capitalism, crony capitalism is incredibly bad. Yes. And lack of transparent markets. Yep. And lack of, well, lack of transparency. And exploitative relations. Is, is bad. Yeah, and, yeah. and, well, the U.S. is full of that. I mean, you know, um, yeah. uh, full of that right now. So it's funny because in some chats and with some groups that I'll go, that I talk to, I either get accused, I either get hit with, you are... I mean, you're a capitalist. You're doing God. How can you bring capitalism into education? Where then I go into another group, and you're the Marxist, and and I am, you know, the the yeah, the Marxist anarchist piece because I'm I'm saying things like, well, you know, crony capitalism is not okay. Yeah, secrecy and democracy do not are not do not go hand in hand. And and Rob um, and I are coming from different perspectives on this, finding common ground in part. I'm I'm much more. A, you know, a, a neo Aristotelian uh, influenced by de Tocqueville, so I, you could say I'm more conservative in that respect than, than Ron. But I don't actually fit into you know today's conservatism. Um, but I am interested because of these these thinkers in these these issues of agency and how students can actually take some control of their own destiny, how how professors can actually be put back into you know, the center of the, the educational enterprise because really it comes down to what is education and students and professors and everybody else is, is, is there to support them, you know, not to, to run the show. Um, but what's interesting about this is, is, uh, this is this is not offering some sort of global solution that, you know, will become the new answer to everything. But it is offering... Um, you know, a response to a really deeply problematic situation having to do with education. And people who think seriously about this from a variety of perspectives can get behind it. Rob and I don't agree on, on, on some of our basic premises, but we can arrive at some of the same conclusions with respect to this. I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things is you have to create protocols, yeah. standards, where and you, and you have to have some principles that you're actually going to going to live by, and one of those principles that prevents things from becoming abusive is, again, transparency. Yes. Okay? yes. Because in other words, access to information, and, and really access to information in this case is price. Okay? The real cost, true, of, yeah. the real cost of something. Okay? That there aren't hidden costs. And where the money's going. Yep. And anybody who, you know, gets, gets involved in a Plano class can know this amount of money is going to the professor, this amount is going to a Plano. Uh, once you guys start, you know, doing anything else like advising, they can know exactly where the money is being uh, devoted to. But it's also going to go into the fact that, um, um, you know, today we had lunch at Skinny Pancake in That's Burlington true, yeah. for forty-eight bucks. Yeah. Um, it's fine. That's part of where that ten percent is going. <laughs> yeah. Well, not that we need we need more students, but yeah. you know what? It's completely appropriate for the faculty to understand and to be able, and the students actually, to be able to look at. A senior administrator's expense account, yeah, and to be able to see um, that Skiff went out to lunch for forty-eight bucks to Skinny Pancake with two professors. Outrageous. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, because um, part of that, I mean, while we all as people have privacy mm -hmm. and we should have privacy, institutions in that roles, serve the yeah. public in their roles to mm -hmm. serve the public good. Okay, or 
we need to not have so much secrecy about the, the operations because it's the secrecy about where the money is going that generates a huge amount of the abuse. And you know, yeah. it's 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 a great and idea. And suspicion yep. on, on people's part as well. Um, yep. So um, uh, you know, that's uh, you know, that's that's where I'm coming from with with that piece. But the agency, you've got to maximize agency. You've got to be for you know academic freedom. Yeah. You also have to be instead of doing hegemonic moves to impose your education on. Other people and on and other other cultures or countries, you know, communities and individuals are perfectly capable of figuring out what they need. They don't need to be told. Um, uh, here's why. Yeah. Here's the format. Here's the here's the 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 deal. And you're they going to implement X certain, policy. You know. Well, it's, yeah, your, it's choice. Yeah. If I think Aristotle can be a benefit to people, and I want to teach you know classes on that, they're free to say. Eh, not for us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you'd say, hey, check out, you know, check out Aristotle, mm -hmm. but you should also have the space to check out um, Gramsci, mm -hmm. um, you know, Marx, uh, Nagarjuna, um, Mencius, uh, Motsu, and you know, a variety of other uh, you know, other sure. ideas. Yeah. Let's talk more about developing agency because this is one of the areas where, where we're, we really have a lot of common ground. And I, I mentioned that I look at these things in, in an Aristotelian way. Um, I'm also, when it comes to this sort of stuff, very influenced by, by de Tocqueville. And de Tocqueville thought that one of the great things about American democracy as opposed to European democracy was that Americans, when they ran into a problem, they would keep things at a low level form, what he called intermediate associations, and rather than just immediately saying, the state should help us out, or you know, in, in our case, it might not just be the state. It might be let's let the market decide, or let's let you know some NGO make the decisions for us. It, it keeps it in the hands of the people who are directly affected. And what the Tocqueville thought was really important with this, and, and we've talked a lot about this, why this is missing in contemporary uh, education, especially on the part of the professors, is by being involved in some sort of governance, even if it's just you know running a club. You, you start to acquire the, the capacities to, to be able to do it on a, on a better and better level. You start to be able to reflect on what's, what's actually good for me. What should I be doing? What should I be avoiding? You're given the chance to, to screw up and to, to make good on that sort of thing. And that doesn't happen with the command control thing, you know, where, you know, what's going to, what's going to get told is, is trickling down and coming to the professors, and maybe they get to say, well, I'd like to teach a class on ancient philosophy next semester, um, but it'll be taught in this, this slot. With a Plano, you're looking for and hoping to cultivate uh, professors who are, you know, just really just, we can come out with it, more entrepreneurial in that way, who are willing to say, yeah, I'll take responsibility for a classroom, and I'm going to put together this structure, and we'll see how, how it works with the students, and um, I mean, I you know the, the agency and responsibility go together. Yeah, you know. I don't know whether you know I'm, th you know the uh, looking for professors who are entrepreneurial. I think that's true, but I think even more importantly is well, you're looking for you're looking for professors who are um, the classic scholar practitioners who have praxis. Yeah. In other words, um, uh, who are out there in the world as um, change agents and helping other people become change agents too, because that's the. I mean, I guess that's I the that's, that's the tension in education yeah. today is that that in some ways you have really disciplinary procedures and reproductions of, of social class and privilege, yeah. um, and and institutions designed to um, do that again and again and again, yeah. generation after a generation, yeah. and how much of the education actually is about you know, liberatory practices where you're where you're allowing people to form and create their own lives and mm -hmm. their own communities and their own associations without telling them um, what to do. And and I think that that right now we're kind of in the in the state of a lot of us are sort of battling against that prescriptive piece in the first in the first institutions and trying to come up with ways in which people can can retake 
can can yeah, take I, charge of their own lives and their own agency. And I think it will be a gradual process. It's one of those, and this is this is Aristotle's point and De Tocqueville's point, and Mill's point about this sort of development of agency. It takes being involved in a sort of consecutive process to to augment that, to, to have it grow. Um, so, say somebody comes in and starts teaching for a player now, they're not, you know, entrepreneurial in that way. It's a space in which they can become that, as opposed to, you know, the traditional department where that's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, the fact, you know, we need, it, it's tough to identify. I think I know the kind of people who are going to be successful with the Aplerno model. I think I know, I think we have a good understanding of, of you know, how are you going to have to develop your skills yeah. to, to do that? And, and, you know, right now, I mean, the professoriate has been socialized in a particular way. Yeah. Okay. That in some ways is designed for the, for that command and control hierarchical system. And, and it selects against that. I mean, I, I have a, sure. I have a friend who, um, you know, does a lot of public speak, speaking in the realm of ethics. And because he was doing it in a popular form, he essentially became persona non grata among his peers. And, you know, that really, that really bothered him. I mean, th thank God he continued with it because it's important work. But, um, you know, the, the way things are currently set up really selects against taking initiative. You know, well, yeah. I mean, it, uh, except, except for the ones who are entitled to it. So if you're in an Ivy League, you get to, you know, design your research curriculum teach what you're going to teach. But if you're, you know, in the majority of educational institutions, in the, the middle and lower tier ones, that's that's just not available. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm not going to, yeah, there are just so many, there are so many ways in which the, the traditional system, I mean, it, it worked for the old means of production. Yeah. Okay. It worked for the industrial tailorist, you know, Fordist model. Okay. But we're in a different era now, and there are some things that are going to remain the same. Okay, but there are other um, types of uh, you know to use um, you know sort of Latour, this you know French uh, you know uh, great French practitioner you know, Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah, um, these are uh, these guys that I'm that uh, I really enjoy to talk about um, sort of non-human agency and mm -hmm. these things called assemblages. Um, which are basically instead of looking at at just people having or not having agency, look at how institutions form and shape people's behaviors and how they have their own tactics and strategy as a as a as a piece of um, as a, a way of, of analyzing what's going on. And you know th things have just changed. The 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 way in which technology, the way in which the internet, the way it has changed. Space and time. Yeah. Okay. It hasn't gotten rid of it, but it allows different types of exchanges to happen. I mean, you and I would never yeah. have met exactly. if, if yeah. Yeah. we hadn't had the internet. We were talking over the internet. This is the first time I've never met. I have never been in the same room Although with we, Daniel Compton. We see Compton. each other through. We uh, see each other yeah. through here, but I've never been in the same room with uh, Daniel Crompton, the our our director of IT. I don't need to. Yeah. Okay. Um, other people that I've you know encountered on. You know, Angelist or, or in building this, uh, several of the you know members of the board of directors, um, students, faculty, never been in the same room, um, but yet we're able to do this work through this uh, through the use of this new assemblage, um, mm -hmm. which is the you know the information technology, and that changes everything. Yeah, one of the things that I particularly found attractive about about Plano, because I was looking at a lot of different types of online education was that, you know, if, if there's anything about which I'm, I'm steering towards, you know, the Marxists, it's that I don't like these sort of prestige hierarchies that replicate themselves. And I see that happening very much so with the top tier institutions. And, you know, technology was supposed to be disruptive. So MOOCs were going to, like, disrupt everything. But then, you know, who got to actually run the MOOCs? It was, it was people who were pulled from you know, the Ivy Leagues and the big states and a few other schools that have a lot of, you know, technology investment. So I've used, you know, this as an example before. I like Michael Sandel. I like his books. I, if I had a chance to take a class with him, you know, in a small setting, I certainly would. But I sure don't think that his, uh, his MOOC ought to be replacing instructors the way that they tried to do in, you know, a few places 
that was a live proposal. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and so what I see a fair amount doing, in part precisely because you're not doing the MOOC thing, um, is this is, I mean, look at me. I'm, I'm practically speaking a nobody when it comes to, to this sort of stuff. I didn't go to a prestigious uh, graduate school. I've published, but so you know, a lot of people have published. And um, I can teach classes through this. And if I do it well, then people can find out about it, and students can say, hey, I like this guy, I want to do some things with him. That's what happened with YouTube. Um, that wouldn't be possible without this, this sort of apparatus. Well, and it wouldn't even be possible with MOOCs, because you, you know, you're not going to get invited to be on edX or Coursera or something like that if you're at a low-tier school or a middle-tier school. Well, the um, I guess there's two pieces is that we can't look at even though you have the evangelists of technology who think of it as yeah. a liberatory practice, technology is not deterministic. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It doesn't, it in some ways can reinforce hierarchies as we see with, you know, the National Security Agency yeah. Yeah. Um, and other, other, you know, nefarious government entities where they use technology to leverage their own networks of, of uh, social political control, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, however, technology can also be um, liberatory if it's deployed properly. Yes. Okay. So I think that's the that's the thing when I was um, uh, creating computer models of I like created a computer model of the institution I attended. Okay. Financial wise, to look at the to look at to play with what ifs of simulation. Well, I, I was keep back when I wanted to be a, you know wanted to join the crowd. Yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, I'll use this to find a strategy that would allow them to deal with this new era. Okay. To deal with the student debt crisis, to cut their costs. Well, when I built the simulation and I started playing with what ifs, okay, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't come up with the strategy. That there were no level le layers, levers that I could push. The transformation was going to happen no matter what. Okay. So my, I guess my point is with that is that you know I was able to realize uh, at least my analysis is we're not going to have a lot of reform. We'll have some change. Yeah. But you can have to use the tech to then empower to identify well what is the most important thing about education? It's a relationship between a teacher and a student. Right. How do people learn best? This is not rocket scientist science. They learn best in small groups. Yeah. How can you then use the technology? to empower those two things, small classes, teachers and students, and how can you create this intermediation where you get rid of the nonsense and you shoot the cash back to the people who are going to benefit, which is yeah. the faculty and the students. So that, that leads into, like, back to those, those two things of debt and the adjunct issue. The adjunct issue is that people can't make a living wage as, as an adjunct, given the institutions that currently exist. Well, yes. you, you need to go to a Plano right? sign because, as a faculty member. Exactly, because with the Plano, you know, again, we, we brought up all this because we're, we're, you know, addressing concerns about capitalist models and, you know, workplaces and things like that. With, with the Plano, the, the adjunct is able to earn a decent wage, in part because they're getting the bulk of the, the payment. Um, and that, you know, then goes back to the student who can get the education much more uh, Cost effectively doesn't have to take. Well, you you guys won't take uh, student loans anyway. No, we're on of course. Yeah, I mean, th I guess that goes. One of the things in terms of social control and political control is the fact that if you receive federal loan, if you receive federal loan money, or you receive loan money from you receive money from anyone, you're on the hook mm -hmm. for something. Okay, they want something to money works. Yes, the way yes, that's the way generally exchange works in a non-transparent market. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, we're not accepting federal student loans for a couple of different reasons. One is that's a great constraint to put your institution under because that means that you have to make sure things are affordable. Yeah. Okay. That you, that you can't get things can't spiral out of control because this is how they got where the institution has gotten in the places where they are currently. Yep. Yeah. And the other piece is that, um, you know, we want to be able to innovate and we want to be able to um, not deal with, you know, regulation is fine. It serves purpose. It serves, it's, it's important to have regulation like, you know, all these, these schools that are accepting 
that takes student loans, like 90% of their revenue is a, is a student loan, okay? Yeah. Um, or grants. You know, what's happening with some veterans who are coming back to the U.S. and right. the schools are getting involved in, in the level of debt. It is totally appropriate for the government to say, you can't, you know, like, hey, we're paying the bill. You can't take out the, um, uh, you know, you, your debt level is too much. You're depending on yeah. too much revenue from, from, uh, from debt in terms of your operations. It's totally appropriate for government to do, to try to limit that. Yeah. But what is, we're trying not to accept, well, we won't be accepting student loans. We won't not accepting. We won't be dealing with that bureaucracy because um, we figure we can offer it without the loan, and then without the loan, then the student can work while they're going through school. Yeah. Okay. They can also um, uh, go part time. We can change the dynamic from going to school during this four year intensive period yeah. to maybe making um, learning back to kind of a something that is kind of fun and exciting, and you do. All the time versus watching, you know, running the race and then wondering what what next. Or, yeah, or watching The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, <laughs> you know, which is sometimes my guilty pleasure. Really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, sometimes I have fun. other shows. Sometimes they're fun. Yeah. Um, we should probably start answering some of the, the questions that have been posed. So one of the first ones that was asked is: Is a will a Therno have an IRB? That's a uh, institutional review board for human experimentation? Um, we are uh, currently working on a business model to deal with, to try and change research just like we're trying to change the adjunct, the faculty pay piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, in many institutions, grants, um, the institution takes 35, 40 percent of the grant and the faculty member gets 60. Yeah. Okay, or it's even worse in some places, believe it or not. Um, IRB is institutional review boards to review research are very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have, you know, we're a global organization, so we're going to have to look at, you know, global standards um, for IRB. But sure, if you're going to be performing some kind of research, um, publishing, something. publishing something, we're going to have an IRB. Uh, I'd welcome anyone who, um, with that background, to start to contact me at skiff at or go. check out the wiki, and then let's figure out the, the structure. Um, we don't want to get into a situation where we're doing things like what Facebook was up to. Um, active, you know, yeah. manipulation of people's um, opinions, uh, well, people's existences willy-nilly. I mean, that, that yeah. for me, that experiment, you know, crosses a boundary. I don't think that experiment with Facebook was dealing with was unethical, and we talked about it on a bunch of our hangouts about whether we were going to leave. We haven't gotten enough feedback yet. The whole thing with Match.com. Yeah. You know. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. not that's not okay. In yeah, my yeah. book, that's not okay. And so, you know, we we don't want that stuff to go on yeah. in our organization. But those, because they're not educational institutes, they would, they would be governed by an ethical board, which apparently Facebook doesn't have. Well, as big as it is, you know. Well, it's a good idea to just kind of, if, just because you don't have an ethics board, well, you call really, me old fashioned, really doesn't, oh, sure, but just because, I mean, the, it's the, kind of a no-brainer for me if I was Zuckerberg, okay, yeah. I would be kind of, number one, apologizing, but if, you know, he, he shouldn't have signed off on, that's not okay. The trouble is, but, is, is some of the corporations that do have that boards, they can, they can turn into just rubber. That can lead us too far. Right? Yeah. Well, so what other questions have we have we got? Have we got so many studies done in online courses require more interaction with instructor facilitation. Absolutely. Oh, let's talk about that. Actually, that's a that's something that we were talking about earlier today. I think that some people get into online teaching because they think oh, this is going to be easy. It's like doing a correspondence course and not have with these students. But in order for it to be, a, uh, in order for learning to really take place, which is what the, the, the course is about, you know, in any in any course, it's more out of an online instructor. I mean, you know this. I know this from from teaching online. You design things for students and try to give them as many resources as possible. But you're on the hook all the time. You know, well, because it's, it's asynchronous. 
you're on the hook all the time. I think the difference is that really poor teaching yeah. in the past was being a door. Yeah. Okay? You had to enter the class how bad that person <laughs> was. Okay? The lecture. I mean, yeah. you know, we've all attended those classes where we walk. I mean, good God, Lord, help us. Okay, deliver us from this professor. Yeah. Um, because, again, behind the one could see. In the online learning, well, in learning today, since it is, whether it's on Canvas or something, it's not a closed door. You can record and look. I think teaching, there's too much of this, and it's, you know, it, it's supported by the traditional institutions of, of, of higher ed. There's this real nice division they want to create between there's online learning, online teaching, yeah. and then there's real teaching that we right. do in the classroom. Okay, and teaching's teaching. You're just, you know, I try to always think of. I'm just using the using the skills. My class mm -hmm. that I teach physically, okay, has um, all the components of my on, you know, of the online course. The difference is that students can work asynchronously. Mm -hmm. The difference is that I can pull in simulations. Okay, in some ways, I think that the opportunity for real learning and interaction and engagement is higher in the online platform than there is in the traditional ed platform because the, my, the students yeah. that enter my class can be from anywhere on the planet, so you instantly have a, you know, you can have an incredible diversity of opinions and backgrounds. Yeah. Um, you can do much more sophisticated things in terms of, again, um, simulations and um, access to different, you know, data and projects and um, the experience can be richer. What you're missing is um, the nonverbal cues yeah. that happen in the classroom, um, and the uh, some of that can be supplied though over over video. I mean, you're right. Sure. You know, the spatiality. No, um, you, you don't know, see I, the sweat. You well, know, you can or the boredom. It if it's good enough. Yeah. yeah, but you don't see the. You know, like you can enter a room and you can sense whether. You know, when you're up in front of the board and you're teaching, yeah. you, you know when you've lost your audience. You know when you've lost the students, and you well, say, "Wow, this lecture really stinks." Good Let me switch yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> but but that's yeah. what we've got to empower. Yeah. That's what we've got to empower is that you know you know what um, you can know what is happening. I think any, you know. I think that just by having to actually focus on course design when you're in the online environment, uh, there's a lot of things you can sort of take for granted. In face-to-face -face class that you cannot take for granted. You have to, you either think about how you're going to supply it or it doesn't get supplied. Yep. You know, because the students aren't going to build it into Canvas. You know, it's up, it's up to us to do that. Um, Although there are there are ways you can get, I mean, the best learning, the best classes that I've taught have been where I become a facilitator and the students are learning and innovating. I've given them the tools to learn and innovate themselves. Yeah. And they basically produce more information and learn in ways in which I can't keep track of and assess. It kind of like something something magical happens and there's a there's an explosion. Yeah. Okay. And you're you're just barely in charge, kind of. It's like yeah. Maybe. It's like you skateboarding know. down a big hill. You no. Know? Skiing. Yeah. You know, going for that, you know, that cool run. You know, or something along that line. A yeah. thunderstorm. Yeah. Let's. Do we have any other uh, questions coming up? Just thinking of it in practice. Let's see. So, no Facebook would block Eep. No Facebook was just thinking of it in practice, teaching students to justify about the paperwork they may deal with. The faculty's paperwork. For a that's planner. a good question. Yeah. Well, you know, um, we're keeping the classes small, you know, again, 25 and under. 20 and under, I think, is a great place to start with. You know, there is going to be a lot more documentation on the portfolio, okay, I, on the skills piece. Yeah. However, since the classes are smaller, that may be easier to deal with than you have a class of 200. Oh, the yeah. difference is going to be, though, that you know that you're getting, I mean, you're getting the revenue, okay? You're getting the bulk of the of the financial payment. Yeah. So it, it incentivizes 
Yeah. It's and your class. Fact that it's your class, yeah. and you own it forever. I as think, long as you get good reviews. So as somebody who's, who's gone through and is close to having finished design his, his first class, and, you know, pitched a class and, and all that, I can say that to, to there, you know, there's some hoop jumping involved, of course, in, in, in you know, pitching a class. But it's the it's sort of stuff that has to happen. You have to have some clear learning outcomes mm -hmm. that we can, in fact, give some sort of criteria for. Because one of the things is you're designing the class, your assignments are going to have rubrics. And the rubrics are going to have to have, you know, clear criteria. Because otherwise, um, you know, I think it's doing a disservice to students not to have rubrics these days for, for a lot of things. Um, and then, you know, what else is required as far as paperwork? I mean, the syllabus, which, you, you know, any instructor should be putting a lot of thought into the design and the syllabus anyway. So that's not really, that's not something onerous. That's, that's the opportunity to decide how your class is going to be structured and to give the students the, the basic constitution, you know, of the class. Well, it, it, it goes back to the switch. I don't think paperwork is necessarily onerous if you own the paper, meaning. Um, or if meaning it's for that, good reasons. Yeah, I mean, meaning that the IP is owned by faculty. Yeah. Okay. You own your class. Okay, that in itself is a revolutionary concept. Yeah. Okay, um, and you can teach not based on whether you've been assigned particular students. Okay, but you can teach so long as your reviews are good and you can attract students to your class. So the politics piece that you have to play. I mean, how many of us have, you know, scrambled in talking to the chair? Oh, pretty please. Can I please have that section on? Yeah. Fill in the blank, and you don't have to do that. You know, there is going to be the marketing. There is going to be help with for us in a plano with um, getting the word out to potential students. Yeah, and that's really really important. But um, I think we, you know, uh, we're trying to eliminate as much of that the 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 nonsense as possible. Um, so we'll see. You know, so yeah. Um, yeah. Any more questions? And then, do we have a couple on YouTube? Oh, what are they? One for me was asking um, if an employer offers a tuition benefit, can they pay it directly? If an employer offers a tuition benefit, well, a can they pay it, pay it to a planner? Um, we can accept the payment from anyone. Okay. I think what has to happen is the student. Why, you know, the student should uh, contact should contact me directly, and then let's figure out how we're going to deal with that. Yeah, a lot of places. But I don't see I don't see where there's a problem. I don't see that being a problem at all. Okay, there's another question on here from Andrea asking, have you recommended that instructors include local or virtually hosted meetups for students to engage in face to face discussion? Have you in, so the question have is have you recommended? Have you have we recommended that that um, instructors hold face to face meetups in person? Or virtually. Or virtually. I think people should have meetups. I think people should engage virtually. Yes. But I um but I actually remember it puts your students at a disadvantage in in a class where they're spread out all over the place for some of them to be meeting the instructor face to face while others don't have that opportunity. Yeah. I mean you know? uh, well I, I think there's two I think there's a bunch of different issues with the with the face to face meetup. I think that you gotta remember that your your students are gonna be from um all over the planet, okay. Yeah. And the time you're the, the biggest issues are going to be scheduling in times when you're all meeting together for virtually. a discussion virtually. Um, if you want to do that, the nice thing about Canvas is you can have asynchronous face-to-face -face discussions, mm -hmm. okay, where you're recording different different answers. I also think um you know uh, so. I don't want to be too prescriptive again. I am. That's a kind lot. of. That's a good thing to talk about. Okay. Going back to this, you know, the whole things that have got this this thing going. Why don't you want to be too prescriptive? There may be occasions where it is completely appropriate and a great idea to have uh, have students be meeting physically. Um, you know, maybe some are meeting physically with an instructor, but but others are away. Like for example, let's say I was teaching a course in. Um, uh, I used this example earlier in tropical biology. And there were a few people who were taking the class and near where I was living in Ecuador. 
and um, we wanted to go through a cloud forest with Google Glass and oh, identify wow. various species. Yeah. Um, and we could broadcast that to uh, the rest of our class. And that would be a, that would be a, a thing that would be very, very appropriate. There you're using the, the work of the students who are physically able to be there as something to benefit the other students. Sure. And that's the key thing. Well, but, you know, but again, I just came up, it took me two seconds to say, well, hey, that rule might not, you know, the disadvantage that you said, actually, I turned it into an advantage. Yeah. So I don't really, you know, it's, we have to trust our professionals, okay? Faculty members are the treasure of an institution, okay? What we though, have to have is transparency, okay, in terms of um, operations and what is expected. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, to quote the immortal movie Spinal Tap, which no one under the age of 30 has seen, but it's a good movie. Should, but should see. But should see. There's a fine line between stupid and clever. Okay. <laughs> and so um, I, I don't like having a ton of, um, you know, we may have to have a ton of, uh, you know, I hope we don't. We may have to have certain protocols or guidelines, but we're going to discuss those as a community, and we're going to arrive at that. And I'm going to constantly search for the um, way in which that rule is not a good idea. I mean, we basically, the relationships, you know, to prevent, yeah, everything's written out in the faculty and student contract. Yeah. And until we need to modify that, that's what we're going to go by. On the, on the course that I'm involved in, I included uh, an hour of office time that I will be in the chat room. Yeah, on the course. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really, um, uh, right. Pat was saying, who's in the room with us right now, she was saying that um, on the course outline, she includes a um, an hour worth of face-to-face of -face office time. Now that's really going to be that is important. But the hour, it's interesting. Remember, since you've got students potentially all over the world, the office hours that you do during the week are going to have to vary. Yeah. You may have to have some early, early in the morning for you, which are going to be late at night, um, you know, middle of the day for your students, and yeah. vice versa. So, the, the, you know, realize, start thinking the paradigm shift of they're anywhere world, so you have to design and create flexibility so that, that people can engage you when they need to. Um, but I also, you know, yeah. I'm thinking still spinal tap and about the amps that turn up to 11. Yes, it turns up to 11. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite part. There's no reason why they can't turn up to 11, you know? But I, I always like it's a fine line between stupid and clever. That's, that's very true. Are you typing the answers when you're on YouTube? No. Um, yes. But this will be turned into a... Um, Daniel might be typing in some of the answers. Oh, okay. because he's saying, certainly. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, we should probably start bringing this to a close. Um, so hopefully... Wait, uh, what? We don't want to go for another hour? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hopefully this is this is addressed a lot of the uh, concerns that people have, so people now have a, a clearer idea of what, what you know what the the Plano model is and how it differs from some of the other uh, educational models out there. What motivated uh, Rob Skiff to to start it and the staff to get involved, and then people like me to to want to become instructors. Um, I'll let you have the last word. Um, you know, I really appreciate your coming up and uh, staying oh. at the house and dealing with me for the last um, uh, four days. I mean, for four days. And uh, thanks to everyone um, who's uh, listening in and, and sharing the videos. I mean, this is this is the most important work that, that I've been involved in. Um, and, you know, the time has come to just to shake things up because what's, what's happening right now in, in higher ed, both nationally in the U.S. and globally, is just not okay, and we need to we need to change it. And the only way we change it is by um, upending the model. That's perfect. See you later. <laughs>